So I'm going to be talking about privacy preserving heavy hitter, heavy hitter detection using federated learning. Uh, and the privacy protection is going to be differential privacy, like many of the talks this morning. Uh, this is based on joint work with Karan Chadha, Junya Chen, John Ducci, Vitaly Feldman, Hanya Hashimi, uh, Omid Javid-Bakht, and Kunal uh, Talwar. Uh, a special shout out to Karan and Hanya, who did most of the work I'm going to be presenting today. OK, so our goal is privacy is heavy hitter detection in very large domains. So. We have a bunch of users who have data on their device, and our goal is to learn what the popular data points are. And this, when users have many data points on device, this is a little bit of an ill-defined problem. What does it mean to be a heavy hitter? There are a couple of things you could mean. You could say something is a heavy hitter if a lot of users have that data point, or if it's very popular for some of the users. What we're going to be saying is something kind of in the middle, so every user has some distribution. I'm just talking about the empirical distribution here. So they have some distribution of the data on their device. And our heavy hitters are going to be heavy hitters in the average distribution. So this is kind of a midway between. You have to be popular for a lot of people um, to be popular in this metric here. So there are lots of algorithms for differentially private heavy hitter detection. Most of the ones that work in a single round, or I think all of the ones that work in a single round, have either very high communication complexity or very high server-side computation. So if you're familiar with rapport, this is an example of something with very high communication. Uh, and compressed versions of rapport have very high server-side computation. So we want an algorithm that works um, well. We're, we're willing to go to multiple rounds uh, and has lower system requirements. And so people have studied this as well. So there's this prefix-based algorithm, which we'll talk about. I'll give more details in a minute. This is an iterative algorithm that has lower communication and computation costs while still having high utility. Uh, it is a multi-round algorithm. So our work, our goal in this work was not to kind of redesign the wheel in these prefix-based algorithms, but to study practical heuristics that improve the performance of these algorithms in practice. So we're going to be talking about constant improvements and things that improve things for kind of typical data sets that we see. So our privacy model. So thank you to all the presenters this morning who introduced differential privacy. So we're using differential privacy. Our model is going to be that everyone is going to use uh, a locally differentially private algorithm to send their data to a secure aggregator. The secure aggregator is going to sum the reports from the different users, and then output where we care about the privacy guarantee on the output of the sum. We have a multi-round algorithm. So this is what's going to happen for every iteration. And then we're going to use composition to use, get the privacy guarantee over all of the iterates of our algorithm. Our primary guarantee is this end algorithm, uh, this end privacy guarantee, privacy guarantee we have after all of the iterations and after the secure aggregation. So this is the one we're going to set a target on. And then the local privacy guarantees are important to us, but they're sort of backup privacy guarantees. So we're going to set our local epsilons to be as large as they can be while still guaranteeing this end privacy goal. Um, and so what they are is going to depend on how many users are in our data sets. Um, so we're going to assume we have a lower bound on the number of users that are participating in every iteration. It's important that we're not requiring that to be the same number of users in every iteration, and we're not requiring them to be the same users, which is very practically important. But we do need a lower bound, and we need a way of enforcing that lower bound without secure aggregation. OK, so that's our privacy model. So what does the algorithm do? So again, we have all of our users. All of our users have data. Our data has become binary strings. Um, and the first thing it's going to do is this, the server is going to tell the users a uh, gonna, what we're going to call a segment length. And then every user is going to pick one of their data points. And they're going to take the, so they've told the segment length, they're going to take the prefix of that segment length of their data point. And now the data universe, the size of the data universe that they're trying to send to the server is just two to the power of the segment length. And now they're going to use a locally differentiated private algorithm to send this to the secure aggregator. 
who's going to aggregate it, send it to the server, who's going to turn it into a histogram over these prefixes. The server is going to pick a threshold, and then they're going to keep everything above that threshold and say, you're a heavy hitter if your count is above the threshold. Then they're going to output this set of heavy hitters of that prefix length. And they're going to choose a segment length for the next round. And then they're going to send the heavy hitter prefixes for the previous uh, prefix length and the new segment length to the users, who are then going to notice that no data point can be a heavy hitter if its prefix is not a heavy hitter. So they're first going to eliminate anything whose prefix is not a heavy hitter in this list up here. And then from the remaining things, they're going to choose one of them. And they're going to extend their prefixes so they include the new segment length more, more bits. And now our data universe is not 2 to the L1 plus L2. It's just the prefix list or the allow list times 2 to the new segment length. So if we didn't get a ton of heavy hitters, which often happens, we're often in this kind of sparse or uh, long tail range where we're going to have our, our heavy hitter list is going to be a lot smaller than two to the, the segment length. And then they're going to go through this process again. They're going to use that local randomizer to send it to the secure aggregator, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the server is going to do the same thing about picking a threshold and choosing a new segment length. And this is going to continue until they've sent their, their entire data point. And notice they pick a new data point at every round. So with every new round, we're getting a little bit more useful data points being sent from the device. So there are three main places I'm going to talk about here where there are kind of choices. So this algorithm sort of existed in essence. Um, but what we explored was how to do this data selection. So they need to pick a data point to send at every iteration. How should they pick it? How should the server pick this threshold? And how should they pick the segment length for the, for the next round? So this is going to be just experiments. This is heuristics. Uh, so our experimental details, none of these are going to be super important. I think most of the things I'm going to say will hold if you changed many of these. Uh, but we're looking at the Reddit public data set. This has 2.6 million users uh, with an average of about 1,000 words per user and about 300, 400 unique words per user. Um, my system constraint, which we'll talk about where that's going to come in later, is going to be 10 to the 7. This is essentially the length of a binary string I can send to the device. Or sorry, the size of the universe I can send. So log of that is the length of a binary string I can send. Uh, my local randomizer I'm going to use uh, at every round is one hot encoding with binary randomized response. If you're familiar with rapport, this is essentially rapport. If you're not, it doesn't matter. Um, my privacy guarantee is I want my end privacy guarantee to be an epsilon of 1 and a delta of 10 to the negative 6. These are kind of reasonable things in practice. Um, and for this many users, this results in a local epsilon of about 7 for every round. OK, so the first thing we looked at was how to do the data selection. So in practice, when users have a lot of data points, they often have a lot of repeats of their data points. So think of this as things you're typing or places where you are or at the same place and you're typing the same thing many times. So when I say kind of pick a uniformly random data point, you have two, two options. You can pick from kind of the six things you see here uniformly randomly, or you can pick from the three unique things uniformly randomly. So weighted is when you pick from the six things, and unweighted is when you pick from the three unique things. Um, and what this graph is showing, oops, sorry, uh, the green and the blue are just showing that having a prefix list or an allow list helps, as opposed to just picking a random thing at every iteration. This is fairly obvious. Um, but this also says that uh, unweighted selection, so picking from uh, the unique things, is better. This is a little bit surprising. We actually expected these to be the other way around um, because of our, our utility metric is really the other way around. You have to be popular. You have to be popular for a lot of people, not just exist for a lot of people. So this was a little bit surprising to us, um, but does seem like unweighted regardless of your error metric is the way to go. 
Um, we also looked at the presence of what the presence of a deny list does. So this is data points that you tell the users at the beginning. I already know these are heavy hitters, so please don't send them to me. Uh, and you can get these from kind of anywhere. The important thing is that you usually don't have access to your actual data set. So you can use kind of an auxiliary data set. So we use the Twitter data set. And this is maybe unsurprising that including a deny list really does help a lot. Uh, what is maybe uh, the other thing to note here is that even if you don't have an auxiliary data set, if you do this algorithm in two rounds, so if you do the entire algorithm to get kind of a warm start and then do the algorithm again, this also results in, in much better results, even if you the privacy budget is shared across the two rounds. Okay, I don't have plots to show that this is useful, um, but this is just how we pick the thresholds. So what's often important is the false positive rate or how confident you are that the things you're finding are actually heavy hitters. They're not just heavy hitters because of noise. So for every data point, it has if it has no, like no one has that data point, there's some probability that after noise, it looks like it's above a threshold. Some, if you pick a threshold tau, you can say some probability that something that was had a true count of zero was noised up to be above threshold. And so what we do to pick this threshold is we look at every tau and we say, this is the this numerator is the expected number of false positives or things that, yeah, false positives I would expect if there was no real data points, if everything had count zero in my universe. And so what we do to kind of heuristically bound this false positive rate is to take that expected number of false positives and divide it by the actual number of things we're finding above threshold and make sure that's below our false positive rate. And we can keep raising our, our threshold until we meet this. And this kind of it heuristically says that most of the things I'm finding are, are not false positives. Okay. I think this is the final of my three things, uh, is segment length selection. So most people had previously done this uh, in prior work by uniformly dividing, picking the number of iterations they wanted to do, and then uniformly dividing this, the length of the word or the bit string by the number of iterations. Um, what we found is it's best to maximize it of every iteration. So what you really want to do is one iteration. If you don't have the system constraints to do that, um, then you want to do it as large as you can. And so most for most of these algorithms, what is important is the size of the universe that the users are trying to communicate. Uh, so this is, as I said before, that's the prefix list at that round times two to the segment length for that round. This is about the universe size. Uh, so you want to make this as large as possible to stay within your, your system constraint, which does also have the benefit of it's better to do as few iterations as possible, which is good for your uh, latency. Uh, okay, so kind of staying on that note for a second, we did want to look at how important having larger system constraints was. So larger system constraints result in fewer iterations, and generally kind of more accurate algorithms. Um, but what it turns out is it doesn't really matter as long as you're willing to increase your latency. So it is better for any particular system constraint to have as uh, large segment lengths as possible or as few iterations. Um, but if you do have lower system constraints and you're willing to do more iterations, you can kind of make the utility about the same. You don't use a lot of utility. Um, this slide is just a kind of obligatory comparison to prior work. Uh, this isn't really a fair comparison. I work, we're doing kind of heuristic optimizations, um, but these green and blue ones uh, are the prior work. The experiments here do have these heuristic optimizations on top of the prior algorithms. As uh, so these were prefix tree algorithms, they use a different local randomizer essentially. So this is really a statement about one hot encoding with two RR being a good local randomizer for this setting. Uh, which is really about it being good for aggregation. Uh, the other thing to note here is that there are two curves that are way better than the, the red one is us. The pink and the green and the orange one 
are using uh, Laplace noise and Gaussian noise. So these do perform better. Um, and are kind of this is also using these heuristic optimizations. So this is really a question about local randomizers. Uh, what is happening here is that uh, Laplace and Gaussian noise are much better in terms of aggregation differential privacy. If you care about your aggregate privacy guarantee, these are much better algorithms. If you care about your local privacy guarantee, they are very bad algorithms, or they're they're worse than one-hot encoding plus two RR. So if you still want a local privacy guarantee, then you're better to stick with rapport or things that look like rapport. If you are willing to kind of give up your local privacy guarantee and just care about the aggregation, then Gaussian is probably your best choice. <laughs>